Some of the biggest film stars and personalities of the past 50 years are represented in the print files of Los Angeles photojournalist Phil Stern. Stern began his career in the late 30s as a freelancer for some of the biggest periodicals of the day, including Life magazine, covering the entire range of assignments, from political candidates to life goes to a party. But his career took an unexpected detour as World War II began. Experienced photographers of draft age found themselves faced with a choice, wait to be drafted, or join the Signal Corps as non-commissioned officers assigned to duty as combat photographers. A combat photography is an enterprise and an activity that I think is limited only to the young and very adventurous and perhaps not too bright because it is, looking back at it, right now at age 67, looking back at it, no way would I ever do anything like that again. If somebody said, Phil, if you could do this whole thing over again, would you do everything the same way? The answer is no, absolutely no. It was utterly stupid. But it, 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 it's stupid in the sense that all the arrogance, all the self-assurance, and, and all the invulnerability that you thinks it has came into play. And, uh, you know, statistically, I'm really quite lucky because most people who, who, who took the tack that I took at that time did not survive. All right, during World War II, I, I functioned in two ways. One was when I was attached to Darby's Rangers, and then after I had been wounded and I was out of that unit entirely, and I went to what was called limited duty, and limited duty was staff photographer to the Army newspaper, Stars and Stripes. Well, there I had what could conceivably be the dream job, uh, in which I had a little card signed by the high command giving me access to any transportation of any unit in the Mediterranean theater of war, space permitting. And they were to cooperate with me in every way. I could go in an aircraft, I could go in a tank, in a car, on a bicycle, didn't matter what. And I could go any place I pleased that I thought would be interesting for the newspaper. The War, de the war Department, to be specific, the Signal Corps, did require combat photographers to use speed graphic cameras. Those were 4x5 plate cameras. And the film supplied were in the form of film packs or film holders. Both were, uh, both were unwieldy, actually. And uh, the circumstances of the war and the terrain and the action and the, the general horror of a, of a war drama is such that those were the most ludicrous, ridiculous cameras to use. I personally dumped two of those cameras off Tunisian mountains into the plains of uh, the desert there. The bones are probably still rotting. And I did that only after I had my own cameras, which were uh, a German 35 millimeter camera and a larger reflex uh, type camera. And those were easy and light to carry, and they took multiple pictures from one roll of film, as contrasted to the single uh, plates for the bigger camera. And I must say that that made life a lot more pleasant. There was one picture I took which I didn't even remember that I saw after I was wounded. Uh, and in the hospital, they showed me a, uh, a photograph printed in which the caption said, this is the last photograph taken by Sergeant Phil Stern. And, and I got scared because it looked to me like the guy was killed, uh, the way the caption read. And then, of course, they flattered me by saying, he took some of the best pictures we've ever had, and we're going to miss him. And I had an eerie feeling, like, like uh, <laughs> it sounded as if I was killed. But uh, to me, it was quite interesting to see the material published, because for a photo professional photographer, uh, he enjoys his photos, but he enjoys them even more when he sees them published. And that, that was the name of the game for me. World War II finished, and, uh, <clears throat> and I returned to Hollywood, where I resumed my career, such as it was. And uh, <clears throat> I worked for the magazines again, and I also worked for the studios. The studios did hire photographers to do photo, to do photographic coverage of films that they made with a little different point of view than their staff photographers. Their staff photographers generally did the glamorous, 
highly stylized type of portraits and publicity photos for the studios. And then the studios decided they wanted to have a kind of alternate point of view. And they sought photographers who had background on national magazines. So I came in that category. So I, among perhaps at that time, maybe a dozen or two dozen photographers, were hired from time to time to cover the films that they made. And the principle, the, the reasoning be, be, of hiring us was that the material we shot would have the advantage of being editorially acceptable by magazines. And they were looking for the editorial placement of photographs rather than the, the advertising type of photographs. And of course, <clears throat> for me at that time, it was, it was an irresistible, it was simply irresistible because number one, unlike all my previous experience <clears throat> outside of the studios, when you photographed on a sound stage, they had a stage all built, they had the most beautiful sets built, they lit it beautifully, they had beautiful lighting, and they put beautiful people in it, and they costumed them, and they made them up. And then they even had people to choreograph them, so that it was a cakewalk to shoot photographs of this, I and mean, you couldn't miss. And, uh, and it was lucrative, it was very well paying, and it was interesting, it was exciting, and it was, my God, even if you were confused about what f-stop to use, to use, you simply went to the head cameraman, and you asked him what f-stop he used for his film. And all you had to do was transpose his f-stop to the f-stop you use on your camera. All you needed was high school arithmetic, and you had no problem with that. So I think you can understand how, how, how uh, irresistible that was.